we're back. So it feels as though we've walked all the way from Munich High End, from the High End show, all the way to CanJam 2023 here in London, Westminster Park Plaza Hotel. This time around, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to talk to the engineers, get their perspective on products, and what they feel as though that they bring and their team brings to the industry. Shall we go and have a couple of discussions? Zach, welcome to London, oh, Canada 2023. It's a pleasure to be here, Toby. Yeah. How are you finding it? Uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, assemble that entire show, <laughs> but oh, it's wonderful yeah. to see you again. I just saw you at Munich, didn't I? So yeah, we were yeah. in Munich, and uh, now we're in London. You know, Munich, we did bring our entire, you know, uh, you know, collection. Of <laughs> but uh, now we're here with you know all our models and everything, and all our gear too, which is kind of exciting. It's quite a sight, honestly. So I'm going to ask you some questions from the other direction of engineering and creating headphones. So tell me a bit about the philosophy, your philosophy in regards to approaching the hobby, approaching headphone design, and when there is a new project that hits you, basically in the middle of the night, like the, for example, the dampening system from the Atrium or, or the brand new Caldera, where the inspiration came from and how you started the process. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have a different perspective probably than a lot of people because, you know, my my beginnings were in as a hobbyist acoustic guitar builder and then as just a hobbyist audiophile and then a modder, hobbyist modder. And so I really came up from the perspective that I think a lot of our, you know, you know, owners come at it where they're kind of want to find what they're looking for and want to be able to really adapt it to sort of their subjective tastes. Yeah. And, you know, I've kind of learned the acoustical engineering part through, you know, a lot of my peers and everything and through all the experiments I've done through the years from T50 modding. And I think what I've found is that, you know, every system kind of needs to have its, its own design. You can't take one singular thing and apply it to everything. So for me, like something like the Harman Curve, while it's a really great baseline and it's very, a great tool, you kind of have to find where every driver, every system, whether it be open or closed or semi-open, where that particular headphone needs to end up to sound its best. Because, you know, kind of the beauty of headphones for me is that you know, you're, you know, just like us as humans, we're in different moods all the time. Sometimes we want to listen to a Susvara. Sometimes we want to listen to a ZMF. Sometimes we want to listen to something that's bright and analytical or an HD 800. And so being able to have some of those choices, whether it be within the same headphone or in your collection, you know, I kind of come at the design from that standpoint of like, hey, what mood or what place might this headphone be for? And then from the engineering standpoint, how can I get the most, like what is this particular driver suited for and how can I design around it with pads in the chamber to get, you know, something that would really fill that spot in the collection. I think that's what's special about ZMF headphones is that you can have all of them and own all of them and they, you can have like different experiences for each one and none of them make each other relevant, uh, irrelevant, I should say. So you can have like an atrium next to a caldera, next to a verite, and pick the right one. That's what I have found is picking the right one for that genre and that mood that you're in. And then within that, obviously, you've got the pad rolling session. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, having something that's unique and really suits, you know, a listening experience where you can really dive into it and lose yourself in it in that like listening session. And so, 
you know, some days I'll be in that verite mood where I want something that's fast and smooth. Some days I'll want the, you know, the caldera where it's really kind of a little more intense and quick okay. um, and comes out with the planar linearity of the bass and everything. And yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of the, the, you know, people talk about end game or, you know, the, jur the journey is the end game or exactly, whatever. It's yeah. kind of like, hey, yeah, I always want to be in that place where I'm discovering new things. And that's kind of what making headphones is for me is just constantly Evolving. discovering what what my needs are as an audiophile and what I love about the hobby so much, which is I think, you know, we always have those moments where we hear a new track and we hear it on the right headphone and we're in the right mood and we're in the right setting. And it's, you know, it's not just about the gear. It's about how do you create that whole experience that gives you that moment where you can really just Lose yourself. flow into the being of yeah. being what a human is and all that stuff. So it's, it's that whole thing. And I think that's, you know, for me, part of why I like, um, you know, the wood metal leather element and the feel of the headphones is it kind of adds, you know, even though it's an aesthetic thing, you know, when you when the sonics are right, the aesthetics are right, and your environment is right, it, it lets you have that experience. Work of art, basically. It's not just yeah. the listening, it's the visual thing as well. Yeah, I mean, if you put a, you know, a great painting of Van Gogh or of Monet or any of that stuff, you know, in a dark garage, you know, I don't think you'd be able to appreciate no. it the same way as you would. Very and true. And I think, you know, for me, that's what, you know, being into audio or being into any kind of hobby that you enjoy is all about is find you know finding the right pieces of gear to give you those moments that you cherish you know? i agree one question in regards to the atrium yeah. that was one of my f favorite is not the right word one of the standouts for me the tuning when that headphone came to be can you walk me through the process of like the day prior the week prior where it didn't exist in your head and then the subsequent months following that entire story. Yeah, I think like you mentioned earlier, the atrium damping scheme is so innate to that headphone and really was what kind of took it from just being, you know, another two dimensional headphone, so to speak, to like a three dimensional, not just talking about the soundscape, but being a headphone that had all those different qualities where it had a little bit of warmth, it had punch, but it had a three dimensional soundscape and a layering to it. And, you know, that idea of the atrium damping system, it, it solved like two things for me. Was one was uh, taking, um, you know, a system that I could apply to in multiple ways throughout headphones. Because the big challenge is it's like a blank canvas when you start a new headphone. Yes, exactly. How am I going to damp this headphone so that, uh, you know, it'll sound its best, but you have to have a gamut of qualities in there and tools, so to speak so that you can get the most out of the driver. And so coming up with that system where I could modify the density of the damping material, the radius of the damping material. And then one thing I realized it's really easy to over dampen or under, under dampen a headphone to where you know, you're either choking the driver or the driver's too free and has too much impulse response. And yeah. it just sounds like everything's going everywhere. And so coming up with that system and realizing, hey, I need this arc. And so that the second thing I was gonna say that it solved was just that idea of not having to put a flat piece of thing right on the driver or putting the stuff right on the back of the cuff. And I got that from thinking about vintage instruments and why they work so well. So old guitars always have a little bit of a radius in the soundboard of a, a flat acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, for someone like me who's built a couple, I realized if you don't put that radius in, the guitar sounds really bad. Yeah. If you put too much of a radius in, it can also sound bad. And so having a malleable radius in the damping material allows you to find, hey, how's this gonna fit within the acoustic system of the cup? And I can tweak it to find, just like an old acoustic guitar, what radius is needed for the, uh, the headphone to sound its best and what material is gonna work best. And so it solves that kind of you know, idea of just- you know, Combine them together. How do I have some a canvas that I can work with that I can change and then not choke the driver too much or keep it too open with too little damp. I see. Yeah. And when the atrium came to fruition and it was built, you sat down, you listened to the final product and you go, okay, this is ready to be shipped out. I'm happy. 
What were the thoughts going through your head at that point in time? Apart from obviously the usual achievement, I'm happy, it's done. Yeah. But like, what did you feel as though you achieved the milestone for yourself at that point in time? Because that was prior to Caldera. So I presume Caldera was still in fruition yeah. in the background anyway, things yeah. normally are. So was it like relief or was it like, yeah. Yeah, there's always I, relief when you finish a, a headphone because, you know, I, all the headphones I work on for years at a time and you know I always have a few projects going that are all aligning each other and they influence each other a little bit but I, I think acoustically with the atrium the thing that I was really proud of and felt really good about in the moment was just being able to have a depth of sound stage three-dimensional layering aspect but still not losing the warmth and euphony you get from an intimate experience and I think a lot of times headphones will sound you'll just kind of do those tricks where you're like this one has a really big sound stage or this one's really intimate yeah and you know being able to sit down with the atrium and realize through different systems that it can sound intimate in one system it can sound really expansive in another system and it'll adapt a bit to the source and the music of what's playing and I think, you know, having that kind of egg-shaped orb with the atrium damping system helped with that. So I just, I felt really proud um, to be able to put something in place that was able to encapsulate some of those things in the same headphone. That's wonderful. I mean, we normally talk about headphones, but then there's always the caveat of a huge amounts of equipment in the background and all that kind of aspect. And when i reviewed atrium i could take it from a dongle all the way to a desktop setup and it was just sublime across everything and you end up walking around with this headphone around the house and not just want to be tied but realizing that you can actually something like this adapt you'd be able to listen to it and still have an incredible performance and it's quite an achievement and i commend you thank you so much for your time thank absolute you. pleasure So we're at the QDC booth for the first time in London, right? Yes. First yes, time. first time in London. This is the V14, the successor to the Anol VX that I started basically the IEM reviews on the channel for. Yeah, it was worth the wait. It's basically the VX, but the next step up. Detail retrieval is absolutely insane. Like using the resistor ladder R2R with the SE300 from Astel and Kern, pitch black background, and it's so controlled and so well tuned. Can I go home now? <laughs> I'm gonna listen to a little bit more and hopefully we can get one for review. This, it was a very strong start. So, uh, Astel & Kern booth, just checking out some of their products. Obviously, this is their latest DAP, the SE300. This is actually the review unit that's come out, come out with me from CMA. So, I'm testing IEMs with it. I just went over to QDC and checked the V14 out. Um, I'm gonna look through some of their stuff and uh, let's see what's actually you guys might find interesting for review. So. Hi, so this is the new IEMs from Q-Style with its inbuilt amp and DAC lightning connection to the iPod. What category of pricing does this thing? Because I've not, I've not checked any information about this. I just had a quick listen. Well, it's on Kickstarter and uh, it's for 229 at the moment. Really? Okay. So this is competing with the, uh, the usual Kato's and S12's and stuff in that category. Actually, this, uh, we designed it aiming for uh, our target is actually biodynamic cylinder. Okay. And, uh, Sennheiser IE9800 something like that. Yes. Yeah, so at the top, top end of the... Uh, 
it's tuned really nicely. It's, it's got the Q style sort of liquid sound that I'm used to, but I would like to actually spend some serious time with this, not obviously a couple of minutes as we do here, but this was definitely really interesting. Yeah. I want to, I'm going to put, I'm definitely going to be bringing one of these in for review. Jamie's going to get some B-roll for us. Um, it's shaped like the Kato's and stuff, so it fits in the ear really nicely, really easily, and it just, absolutely no issues with fit for me, even like this quick. We designed the uh, ear cap to be specially formed that it's, it's really soft, so you, you can go, it goes up into your ear and it does not cause any pain. Yeah. And it's, it's a really tiny bore as well, so ear, ear canals are not going to have issues, small ears and stuff, so yeah, fantastic. You guys uh, bought in a amp deck as well, is that correct? You're right. Ooh, that's the one I'm excited about. <laughs> oh, that's so slick. So it's really compact, but like it's got weight, but it's light. It feels really, this is... So this is just an amp DAC or it's a uh, it's a DAP? It's, all, it's also a, uh, this is just a amp DAC. Okay. A recorder. A recorder. For vinyl. For what? For vinyl. For really? Okay, this is a really interesting product, and uh, obviously you can skip and stuff. So if you're listening to music and stuff, right? Fast forward and stuff. So. You can select sources. You can select uh, recording. Or you can select, uh, it's called a AKM. Uh, 4493. Okay. Jack inside. And also the Do you have a. Oh, I don't have an IEM with me, damn it. Um, <laughs> it's not tuned yet. It's not tuned yet, no? It's not tuned yet. Okay. I'm going to review this. I will attempt to review this. That's so, what I said in the email. Yeah. I'm going to review this. So, but look at that. As light, compact. Can I get up and put it in my pocket? <laughs> I'm, I promise I'm not going to walk away with it. No problem. It's very, very pocketable. Yeah. And you can use the sources on your iPhone, Android. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to London. Oh, so, nice to meet you. Pleasure, Person. absolute pleasure. Likewise, we, so we've been chatting over emails since before Munich, actually, right? Exactly, it's yes. been a long, it's a long time. How, how have you been finding it, first and foremost? I think it's a fantastic experience for everybody in the team. Uh, very first came to so excited. Being here with all these guys, testing new earphones, with new people, like new friendships, right? Definitely. This community is fantastic. It's like, like place. Everybody's so enthusiastic. Of course, yeah. Logo. Wonderful. And Tell we are the only brand from Greece. Yeah. Making earphones, government universal. So it's like being so proud of ourselves. It's amazing and you guys are here. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, tell a bit uh, about the company and your philosophy and how long kind of you've been doing this and how you build your IEMs. Give me as much information as you can in regards to the whole story of your perspective for building custom monitors and universal monitors. Okay, so SoundStuff has been around since 2018 around as a company that makes IEMs okay. in Greece. Uh, we both make universal and custom monitors, mm -hmm. of course. We use the printer uh, to print the cells and everything, the face plates, and uh, we do them in house. Yeah. In this, we have our own lab. Actually, there's another company called Ear Medical, which is our parent company, mm -hmm. which deals with uh, audiologist matters and hearing aids. Okay. So that's how Sounds was born. First, it was this company about uh, hearing aids, and then we had the idea to expand the whole IM industry as IM manufacturers. Interesting. At the same time. Yeah. So since 2018, uh, we've been producing uh, earphones for singers, performers in Greece. So most Greek singers use sound products. So the professional market, basically, more yeah. than the audio file yeah. enthusiasts. The start was more about the professionals. Okay. And now we want to expand more our reach to the audio file community. Yes. Worldwide. 
That's fantastic. What did you guys find the coloration between uh, the medical side of things into the more enthusiast side of the IMS? What crossed over did you guys find that what, what information crossed over and what kind of met in the middle and created this synergy between the two fields? Okay, I think that as a start, when you first have to create some hearing aids, uh, custom made, of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a bit the same procedure in terms of the monitors. But of course, when you start with hearing aids, you don't have to do with crossovers, networks, get drivers, and everything. So uh, at first, it was not the easiest task, of course. Okay. But you know, we had to we have the demo experience with it in the field. Yeah. Uh, and we have been like doing this for five years already. Yeah. So we are pretty confident that now we have the lineup to compete in the market and okay. provide for the needs of all your files and just alike at the same time. Fantastic. I have one cool question that I've been actually asking a lot of IEM manufacturers. Which aspect of building a, even a universal IEM is the most difficult? I've always found it to be the treble region where getting everything coherent seems to be the most difficult part of the um, sonic characteristics. Is that still, is that actually re the right thing from you guys? Yeah. From your perspective? Yeah, I think the table isn't easy to get right, of course, because it's also a matter of preference, because some people prefer bright tunings, right? Mm -hmm. Other prefer darker, so you can't fulfill everybody's uh, wish at the yeah. same time. No. So you have to find the middle ground in order to cater for everybody's needs. Yeah. And that's the tricky part. Especially with the treble region, it's difficult to fulfill everybody's uh, preferences and tastes, okay. right? Yeah, so treble is too difficult sometimes to get it right. I see. So, also, yeah. go on, you go first. Yeah. Also, it's not about the treble, it's all about the bass as well. Some people prefer lighter bass units, others prefer more bass. So, it's just the sweet spot that you have to find every time, with mm -hmm. every morning, right? And you have to test R&D and gather feedback for everybody in the community. How is this? Is it, is it likable? Is it not? So it's not as easy as it looks to actually tune the monitor every time. And, uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's also fun of it because it's fun. Yeah. You have to experiment and change things and uh, find your way out. Fantastic. <laughs> and you guys implemented the switch for the bass response in yeah. your IEMs to reduce and boost. Exactly, so it's up to your choice what you want to do with the bass. Uh, you can have it more pronounced and more impactful when it's in the up position. Otherwise, you can change it down. Okay. I think it's also it's very handy because some recordings usually come with lighter bass cells. Yeah. So you can adjust it on the go wherever you are with your fingertip. Mm -hmm. and that's very nice, I guess, as an option, I guess. And the change between like ba uh, the bass response is very, very easy. You just sort of flick it up. It's You don't yeah. need any tools or anything. That's Nothing, what I like about just, it. Just the fingernail. That's yeah. it. It's just... and, you know, also it's very sturdy. Yes. As a mechanism. It won't break sooner or later. It's, it works. It's professional. Yeah. I was actually very intrigued by that. Can you talk to people a little bit about the resin and the technologies you guys have implemented for the nozzle that warms up with your body temperature? Perfect. So all our monitors come with uh, fully biocompatible and hypoallergic resin. That's uh, healthy and uh, creamy, of course, as a resin material. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, if we go custom, we have the other option, which is called FlexFit Pro. Yeah. Uh, this is a groundbreaking in terms of fit and comfort, because uh, this resin is more malleable and, more, and softer. Than so after like 15 minutes of use mm -hmm. inside the canal, this resin becomes softer and cooler. So you don't feel anything at all. It's like uh, wearing nothing at all. Yeah. So professionals basically wear their custom IEMs for way longer than 15 minutes. So that duration will never be an issue for people on stage, etc. because yeah. the body's temperature rises, obviously if they're dancing and stuff like that. So yeah, and also it, when you move your jaw, sorry to interrupt you, when you move your jaw, sometimes you feel the pressure of the resin, yes. of the custom monitor, right? If this resin is cooler and softer, you get it that it feels It just all blends easier. nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Fantastic. Yeah, it's nice. One and final. Also, yeah, go on. Another tech we have is the ambient filter technology. Yeah. Which lets you hear your surroundings while also having isolation at the same time. And also it helps for the pressure relief of the kind of Okay. Like when you were a uh, custom IEM, and usually the, the BA driver custom IEMs, they're fully sealed. So yes. So you feel nothing outside. It's like you are isolated from the world. Yeah. 
this can be a bit tricky and a bit, let's say, a bit annoying sometimes. Mm -hmm. You want to hear your surroundings, maybe if you're on the go or if you're on the stage, you want to feel the beat, feel the rhythm, feel the audience at the same time. Yes. Right? So with our MBC uh, tech, we can actually let you hear the surroundings no matter where you are, in the stage, on the go, for example. Oh, okay. While also having a wider and bigger sound stage. Instead of having the open back headphone version in an IM, yeah. with no liquids at all. That's, that's yeah, amazing. Because the yeah. sound goes in the ear, but you just hear the surroundings from the outside. That's right? amazing, yeah. yeah. It's so cool. And also for the pressure relief side of things, uh, because you know when you have uh, the sealed in sealed, closer, it really does build up pressure. If there is no, if there isn't a vent there, it really course, does. Yeah. It can build. Up. Goes to the ear drum. Yes. So now with this filter, what you can do is actually relieve your ear a bit. Yes. So you can listen to for many hours with no pressure at all. That's healthy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. And it lets the air canal breathe. So, yeah, of course. Yeah. You don't feel so close inside your head. You feel like. The monitor is more open. Yes. In terms of sound states and of ear canal pressure at the same time. And it doesn't affect the bass response, you still get decent bass you response. Get the bass response. Yes. You try yeah. it. Yes. Right? I did, yes. Yeah. Definitely. Response, yeah. We're going and to get bass, full analysis of this, yeah. Of course, you had it. And the bass becomes a bit more, let's say, um, diffused in a way. Yes. It becomes uh, wider. In and more blended with the outside noise to create this sort of like natural feel exactly. where it breathes, yeah. most definitely. Because the eardrum actually doesn't take any pressure. The pressure goes to the ambient filter. Yeah. That's the whole point of the tech. To have the pressure going to the ambient, not to the rear canal. Mm -hmm. So you feel safer and healthier. And you have all the benefits of what the sound stays. And, and you don't annoy anybody with a leakage of sound, basically, of as well. Not. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's fantastic. Thank yeah. you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. it Thanks again. Likewise. And uh, we'll see you again. Yes, definitely. I'm going to be hanging around, so I'm going to come back and have, a, have another listening session as well. You Thank have. you. Cheers. <laughs>
enemy number one and the ring deck aims to solve problems that are present in other deck architectures where you might get harmonic distortion coming into the signal and what we aim to do is go to extreme lengths really to minimize that as much as we can to leave a natural sound from the system and that same DAC technology that you find in the Lena DAC is also present in Bartok, Rossini, Vivaldi, all the way through the DCS range. I see. And what is uh, DCS philosophy on transient response and timing? Um, do you guys focus on this area as a central kind of pivotal point of the setup or is just a small aspect of the whole story? So it's, it's one of those areas where People often use the term no compromise engineering. Engineering is by definition compromise. It's a trade-off between multiple things. Correct. And so when it comes to transient response, the trade-off there is really the better your transient response, the worse your frequency response in terms of in Nyquist image rejection. Mm -hmm. um, so any filter within the DCS stack is always flat up to at least 20 kilohertz. Yes. Um, but then you know, the, the longer you make your filter, the more you start impacting the transient response, the more you're going to be removing Nyquist images. So it's not something where we feel we should be telling the user how to listen to their music. If you're listening to something which is quite dynamic, it's got a lot of transients in the music, some, some pop or some rock music, then a shorter filter might be more appropriate to use. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you're listening to something where having those Nyquist images potentially impacting the harmonics of the music where transient response isn't too much of a concern compared to pop or rock, something like classical or you know orchestral music, yeah. um, then a longer filter might be more appropriate. So that's why we give the user the choice within okay. the product. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit about the clock and the streamer? It's a mm. very interesting product in the Lena stack. Um, tell me a bit about it, especially for those people who are not sure what it is and how it integrates into the system and what happens in from your perspective, not from my perspective yet, because hopefully I'll be reviewing it and giving my perspective, but from your perspective or from DCS's perspective, how this improves on what basically the Lena DAC is doing as a baseline anyway, in conjunction with the amplifier that's already set up. So when you have that stack together, what happens and what happens with and without? And this is this is with the, the clock. Yes. So the, the use of master clocks, that's something the DCS um, pioneered. We've been, we've been using them for uh, around 25 years. Um, originally, this was in recording studios where you'd use a master clock to keep banks of several analog to digital converters yes. synchronized that's working right. together. Um, but it turns out that it's actually a really good thing to do from an audio quality perspective. So when we look at the Lena system, mm -hmm. we have very, very high quality quartz crystal oscillators inside of the DAC, generating the clock signal that the DAC uses. Okay. But any variation to that, any jitter that we get in the system uh, degrades the sound quality. Yes. And so we need to minimize that as much as we can. Now, you always need to have those clock crystals very, very close to the DAC circuitry. Um, the use of a master clock, the DAC has a lot of jobs to do. So the power supply has to run the DAC circuitry, the streamer, the analog output circuitry, there's a lot more circuitry inside the product giving off RF. Mm -hmm. um, so when we take that, that same quality of, of oscillator and place it in its own chassis with its own power supply, much less circuitry inside of the unit, um, the power supply doesn't have to run all of these other things, yes. it, can, it can produce that clock signal much more cleanly with a higher level of accuracy. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we actually lock the clock crystals inside of the DAC to the clock crystals inside of the Lena clock. Okay. Um, and it's essentially like we're removing a lot of those potential sources of jitter from the system. So you're then getting better timing response from, yeah. uh, from the system. Um, when you remove jitter, um, it depends on the nature of the jitter as to how it sounds, uh, but it really, really clears things up. Um, and it's definitely something if anyone has the opportunity to listen to the Lena stack, we would, we would recommend they try it with and without the clock. I definitely agree because even in a showroom floor, in, I mean, setting aside a quiet room like this, I mean, even upstairs, um, are we downstairs? No, downstairs. Yeah. Um, you can tell even on a showroom floor that there is there's there is there is a change when you switch it on or not, when you integrate it and when you take it out. Basically, yeah. it's instantly noticeable. It's not like playing around with a filter. Sometimes it might be hit and miss. Sometimes it might not be, but it's definitely there. Like upsampling and non and NOS, you can instantly tell. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, one final question. I'm I'm genuinely curious with the Vivaldi, when. Did you guys give the engineers like um, a time limit or 
where did they start from? Uh, that DAC really fascinates me mm. and I'm so, genuinely curious about it. Yeah, the, the Vivaldi was the direct successor to the Scarlatti, which was our, which was our previous range. Um, and so we've managed to capitalize over the years on improvements in technology in general. So some of the changes that we, starting from Scarlatti, then implemented in the Vivaldi DAC would be things like on the Scarlatti, we had with the ring DAC core, mm -hmm. um, Four, essentially four current sources went through one IC. So four, four of the switches that turn on and off the current sources lived on one IC. Yeah. Um, we separated those out into individual ICs for the Vivaldi, just as the, the technology of the ICs improved and, and became more widely available. Um, and it's been, yeah, so Scarlatti was very much the starting point and we've then improved on it. Okay. There. Um, one of the interesting things that's then happened during the lifespan of Vivaldi is the shift away from silver disc playback towards streaming. Yes. Um, so making sure that, as with all DCS products, it had enough processing power, enough bandwidth in the FPGAs to be able to implement streaming services as they came available and you know, computer audio type um, features. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. It's always wonderful chatting to you as well. Um, absolute so pleasure, pleasure. Hiya, pleasure to meet you. Koji from Convince Me Audio. Mike Smith from Propel UK. Absolute pleasure. Um, these have been the intrigues for me. Um, I've reviewed obviously the Stellias, the Utopias, the Clears and all that kind of stuff. So I've been hunting these ones for a while. Tell me as much information as you can about this and what Focal was trying to achieve over the very successful OG Utopia. The original Utopia was rivaled for the six or seven years it was out, so everybody called them the flagship of the headphone industry, so um, it was very hard to, to think about what was following that, what was coming next. So we tried not to reinvent the wheel, okay, sticking to our philosophies of um, headphone development, our sound signatures, and the technology that goes into it. So we retained the brilliant driver, mm -hmm. but now we made the, the driver into an M-shaped driver phone technology. Like the clears and like that sort of thing? Okay. And uh, what we use in our hi-fi ranges, our four standing speakers and the tweeters and things like that. Yes. So uh, using that technology for better sound dispersion, um, we made the driver lighter, okay? So the actual driver casing a lot lighter. Okay. And additionally, obviously, We've added a great deal of styling to the to the, the headphone now, yeah. which is really a step up from the old Utopia. So a lot a lot more of the the nods to um, our Utopia branding, which is the red um, the red branding you see in the centre there, and then a yin and yang symbol, which we're using on all of our um, upper ranges. So we we concentrate a lot on trying to stick with the philosophies of the original Utopia and take take it to the next stage. Up. Yeah. Um, recycled flaked carbon fiber um, headband as well, which makes it a little bit lighter. Um, obviously, there was some, some thoughts with the original Utopia that it was easy to go a little bit lighter. So, um, Are we still still using the Limo connectors? Still, still Limo, connect Limo connectors, connectors yeah. Okay. Um, obviously, it's the most secure um, and, and um, connector we can find on the market. Yeah. So, um, yeah. That's What's the uh, impedance of these? Uh, are they still, um, from memory, the other one was 40 or 80, I think, the OG. 80, 80. So is it still the same? Yep, exactly okay. the same. Okay. So it's the same, so very, very um, uh, efficient. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. And uh, what did you think of them is the question. Um, so, I love the Utopias. Um, I bought them actually for myself, not just as a review unit as well, and I love it on tubes, because I think that's where it's true strength lies. But I felt as though this one, this amplifier is solid state, right? 
It's AB, yeah. It's AB, yes. So, yeah, I think it's a bit more friendly in the, I mean, it's obviously a quick listen and one amplifier as well. Um, it was, the tuning is a bit more relaxed in the treble region. It's a bit more of a darker background and a bit more lusher mid-range. The sort of thing you would get on the OG Utopia, for example, on tubes. Yes. And totally. this just seems to be, now it's everywhere. And I'm just genuinely curious what it does on like the LTA Z10E tubes or something like that now. Yeah, it would be nice to make sure that it still retains the qualities it was yeah. given on a tube. Obviously, because we're the same company as Name, everything we make is tuned with Name amplification. Yeah. In the same way that every every amplification Name make are tuned with Focal headphones. Oh, interesting. Speakers. Okay. We're the same company. Okay. So, um, you know, all the electronics built in Salisbury in uh, in the UK, and everything in the headphone and speakers made in Cincinnati and in France. Okay. So um, I've definitely not um, reviewed any of these amplifiers, but it sounded lovely. It was very transparent, very lush mid-range. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that comes from um, Name's heritage of amplification. You know, the, um, uh, the, this is the headphone edition of the Name Unity Atom, okay. but this is the headphone edition. So they've taken out the big um, speaker driver amplification, added in a high-end um, headphone amp, and this becomes a dedicated headphone uh, edition Atom, and it becomes streaming technologies, um, uh, as well as input sources. Okay, so, but um, what DAC were we using, or is it all all in one? Is it an all in one? Oh, it's all, oh, fantastic. What's the price point of this thing? Uh, 2499. Really? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's so, so it's a The synergy version. was really nice. The synergy was really, really nice, genuinely. Well, okay. You can tell they're made together. That's the point. Yeah, they, they, they were well. very smooth. Um, do you guys send out review units? I've not worked with you guys before. Obviously, I'm working with Hi Fi Man and. Uh, Warwick Acoustics and all that lot, but I've not, I've not sat down with you guys yet. But I would love to. Well, let's let's, let's, let's make that thing. It's my card there. Thank you very much. Um, so so um, drop, drop me a line. I will do it, definitely. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll sit there and have a more refined listen um, in, a, in, a, in a quieter environment. Yes, of course. Um, and then maybe sit down and, and talk a little bit more about name side of the uh, our world. Most definitely, that'd be fantastic, especially our own UK. You know. I just like to push. Our, I genuinely love to push our UK brands a little bit, you know. So that'd be wonderful. I mean, they even have a reputation in the world. Yeah. You know. So, um, so yeah, it'd be good to, to get those across. Well. Definitely. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. So Yamaha, very old established brand. Uh, coming from the other side personally, I'm very used to your guys, the studio monitors obviously, the original NS10s and yeah, yeah. that side of the industry obviously. Your latest headphones and amplifier in now, right? Correct. So yeah, yeah. So uh, tell us a bit about Today that. we've got the YH5000 SEs, okay. the flagship autodynamic headphones. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, our history goes back uh, 1976 with the HP ones. So we uh, we had a, a run of autodynamic uh, models yeah. up until the late 80s, and then we stopped. So now we're back. Uh, we actually released these last year, mm -hmm. uh, 2022. Uh, but we now have, for the first time in the UK, the HAL7A headphone amplifier slash DAP. Now, uh, we've actually followed our hi-fi heritage with this headphone amplifier. Uh, in that we use a floating from ground and balanced amplifier um, configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, it's equipped with two toroidal transformers, one okay. for the main amplifier, one for the preamp. Uh, we're using the latest, uh, one of the latest uh, Sabre DAX, the ES1938 Pro. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're, we're very pleased to be here. It's been a long time. As I said, we 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 stopped doing orthodynamic headphones in the, the late '80s, but uh, well, come back, back, back yeah. here uh, or last year, should we say, um, setting a new uh, uh, um, reference point. Mm -hmm. Certainly with the YH 5000s lots of great comments already, yeah. and uh, we're really pleased to be back. Fantastic! Welcome back. And who is this pointed at? More the industry of engineers or the audiophile community, or both? 
Uh, I would say uh, it's both, really. Mm -hmm. uh, Enthusiasts, so basically, yeah. Enthusiasts, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's uh, obviously a, uh, we've created the headphones for uh, the consumer audio market. Yeah. Even though they are very um, uh, honest, very natural sounding, you could potentially use them for mixing and mastering. Okay. Uh, but they are intended for the home audio and consumer. Uh, Hi, hi-fi, basically yeah. the hi-fi side yeah. of things. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, the topology of the headphones, can you go get a bit into that? Like, the what was the en engineer's thought process, kind of like, what, what was the design implementation and what did Yamaha think, okay, let's take this route for these headphones, seeing as we're coming back into the fighting arena of headphones, what did you guys choose? So, um, the YH5000SEs actually were in production uh, for six years. Okay. And it was one guy that was designing the driver. So we use a, an ortho, orthodynamic driver, mm -hmm. which is a planar magnetic design. Gotcha. So we do a, a few things that uh, make it an orthodynamic, a Yamaha version. Uh -huh. um, and over the six year period, uh, the engineer listened to and created uh, almost 1,000 versions of the diaphragm before Yikes. we got to the final design. So a lot of time and effort has gone into the driver. Okay. Uh, of course, the um, construction of the body and uh, the, the fit and the finish, uh, that was done by two other guys. So three engineers were involved in making the YH5000 SEs mm -hmm. what they are today. Yeah. But just to talk quickly about the autodynamic driver, mm -hmm. uh, it's a 50 millimeter driver, yeah. uh, and it consists of five layers. Uh, the first layer is the face plate, the bit you can see, yeah. where you've got uh, magnets mm -hmm. on the back of that. And then the second layer is what we call a micro perforation air damper. It's a very thin piece of material that lets the diaphragm breathe correctly. Okay. And then the third layer down, we use a thin film diaphragm, which is corrugated to help uh, reduce resonant frequencies from building up. Okay. But actually, as part of that thin film diaphragm, we etch the voice coils onto this uh, diaphragm, so it's one piece. Okay. Fourth layer down is another micro perforation air damper, and then fifth layer is the, uh, the magnets, the back of the driver. So Fascinating. The, the okay. What's the impedance of this? 34 ohms. And the sensitivity? I don't have that information to me with me today, but uh, I'll try and find out. And get that oh, that's fine. I can, I'll put that in the description. It's not a problem. Um, uh, do you find them to be easy to drive, hard to drive? So they're relatively easy to drive. Okay. Um, the responses we've got so far from a lot of people have been that the 5000s uh, respond very well. Uh, to higher end electronics, you can yes. go quite far with them to get the best out of them. Oh, okay. Um, so Basically, yeah. they scale up tremendously, yeah, like so the rest of the planars now, yeah. Without naming, well, I'll give you a reference point. Mm -hmm. They didn't seem uh, as happy driving off of a um, cord mojo. Yeah, really I work. understand where you're coming from now. Okay, it's not a portable situation. We're yeah. talking about yeah. a desktop setup. Okay, Correct. no problem at all. Well, thank you so much for all that information. I really thank do you. appreciate it. You're welcome. Fantastic. Hello. Welcome to London Canton 2023. I, I feel Welcome. like we've raced each other from Munich. I just saw your <laughs> colleagues over there doing yes. the documentary over there. So what did you guys bring to the show today? So in terms of our new products for today, we're showing off obviously the ICANN Phantom yes. um, and we've got the GoPods and something that's oh, yes. completely unreleased is the uh, ZenCan signature, which is coming out soon. Uh, can't give you an exact date, but th this is the first show that's appeared at. Fantastic. Where does the Zenkan signature sit in the lineup? So I would say you must be familiar with the Zenkan. Yes. Um, it's an upgraded version of that, so it's got better capacitors. So it's got Panasonic Oscon capacitors. It's got Elna 2 capacitors. Comes with an iPower um, power supply, so active noise cancellation. Uh, lower noise floor, better components, you know, just an upgrade all around generally. Um, we used to have Zenkan signatures for specific headphone models. Not sure if you're aware of that. Not that one. 
Okay, so we had like some for Meze Classics 99s, um, which had a specific EQ curve to kind of neutral, you know, flatten the response a little. Yeah. But to be honest, it was a niche of a niche. And we thought, you know what, let's modify the circuit. Let's take out the, the EQ for specific headphone models and let's just make it more kind of... Baseline reference. Exactly. Okay, fantastic. Would love to look at the of course, so they're to your left. I'll uh, put them in your hands now in front of you. So they come in a, in a you know, travel case that charges them. So it's a true wireless stereo system for IEMs. Um, the 399. You've only got IEMs on them, these are your... Let me have a look. I'm just gonna come to your side here. Uh, so they've got the Meze Advars on. Oh, okay, yes. So, um, if you get the standalone GoPods without um, any IEMs, yeah. you get uh, ooh, two pin and MMCX connectors. And then you can also buy A2DC, T2, and Pentacon connections. Oh, what's the battery life like on this thing? So uh, the GoPods kind of last six, seven hours per charge. Yeah. And then the case lasts around 35 hours. Once they're out of charge, you pop them, pop them in the case, give them a couple hours, they'll charge right up. And what codex does it support this one? So it's up to, you know, LDAC 2496 and uh, 990. That's fantastic. We're definitely going to be having a look at this. this Good. Really Thank you. Yeah, it's, really cool. it's, uh, it's, you know, if you, if you have an expensive IEM and you want a solution that breaks the cable, it's perfect. Definitely being uh, so inundated with our flagship IEMs at the moment. Yes. So. Fantastic. Thank you. I can get that paired up for uh, with an iPad if you'd like to hear them now. Yes, please. Of course. Amazing. So you've got touch controls on either side. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. So uh, currently it's going a bit crazy. Yeah, but, I'm uh, not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So. Uh, you can control like the touch, touch latency response through our um, Gaia client application. Okay. Um, yeah, you've got left and right respectively. They're hooked up to this iPad, and we've got a, a downloaded tidal playlist of FLAC files. Okay. Just put the volume to zero for me, please. Of course. Right Is that comfortable for you? Very much. Of course. Have you got a genre preference? We've got kind of twenty or so songs. Just shuffle it. Of course. Yeah, just I'm definitely going to have a chat to you guys for review. Definitely. This is really exciting. That would be amazing. We'd love you to uh, to review them. Uh, I'll have a chat to Karina. Of course, yeah. yeah, yeah that is, that's really cool. I want to try it with like, we've got a bunch of IEMs uh, here. Yes. So it would be a really, really interesting to actually take it on. That would be amazing. They've got auto impedance matching, so they suit kind of any IEM you throw at them, really. That's fantastic. I'm just uh, really surprised by the comfort, like because I thought they would be kind of heavy and stuff. But yes. Very nice Are they? I think they weigh like something like 20 grams. Don't quote me on that. It's it's rough, roughly 20 grams. That is something. Like thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, 64 audio. Hi. Hey. Pleasure. How's it going? Not too bad. What's the 64 audio message from the engineers and from your guys' perspective? You guys have been veterans in the industry for a long time, so yeah, I mean, very established. The, the key thing, you know, we want to try to do is bring, you know, the, the true sound uh, and what we want to hear out of their music and what they're listening to, to them. Um, and, you know, one thing that with our technology, with like TIA technology is getting that more mature sound, that wider sound stage um, that people like to hear. And even with that, you know, we have our U12T, which has been real popular, and uh, even our U18T uh, giving nice, clear detail and kind of a good, good neutral jumping off point for people to uh, experience our sound. Um, and you could ask anyone who has uh, listened to our product before, the U12T is a... a uh, it's very loved. It's very loved it's by so the community. As well. Yeah.
fantastic. And you guys bought everything to the show this time around, right? Yeah, we have all of our universals. Uh, we just don't have some of our uh, our entry level customs. Um, but I mean, the line starts off at the U4S, which recently was released. Um, our four driver hybrid, um, all the way up to. Uh, price point? Out of curiosity. Um, so in USD, the U4S uh, goes for ten ninety nine. Um, okay. And uh, from there, it goes all the way up to uh, uh, $35.99. Nice. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your time. I really do cool. appreciate it. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you. Take it easy. Well, true wireless IEMs, unlike anything seen before. Pleasure. Hey, Hi. pleasure. I'm How's it going? It's nice to Koji. meet you. Koji. So tell us a bit about what you guys bought to... Looks very shiny. Well, <laughs> we did bring some shiny toys. Uh, but these are hi-fi toys. These are powerful uh, first-class listening instruments Okay. Uh, that feature an ARM quad-core processor, an ARM M0 co-processor, co twin 10 silica cadence hi-fi DSPs, Sonian armatures, Knowles quartz analog microphones, nine axis accelerometer gyroscope so we can do things like head motion control, mouth control where you lick your teeth or snitch your tongue, for voice control, and we're also multi-axis touch control. Interesting. And all of that compute then is connectable through the app to command and control other internet connected devices. So you could uh, open your garage door or trigger your looper pedal if you're a guitar player, okay. maybe set the click track by just nodding your head faster or slower. So. We believe the future of, of hi-fi listening experiences isn't just listening to music or with a wireless product speaking on the phone, but rather using your ear computer as a command and control interface for all kinds of other connected devices and software. Fascinating. So, I mean, it's in your ears at the same time, right? So you might as well get some good use out of it, you, right? You might as well. In fact, if you think about wearable tech in general, uh, how often in the day are you, are you really going to be jerking around with your wristwatch? The fact of the matter is, it ties up both your eyes and both your hands. Yeah. The thing that's cool about in-ear computing is your interface is auditory, right? Yeah. And you're not using your hands. You're using your head, your, your voice, yeah. other kinds of, of, of actions. And so in that capacity, we can add a lot of value to the way that people are interfacing already with the rest of, the, of their lives with a product that most people are wearing for hours a day anyway. If you walk around any airport, you know, you're going to see yeah. everyone with AirPods. In. Yes. And the AirPods are a fine thing, but they don't do very much and they sure don't sound good. Yeah. So when you put enough compute power in, you add the high power DSPs, class AB amplification, all the stuff that you would do with a desktop rig, miniaturized down to fit in your head, it gives you a hi-fi experience not unlike what you're getting with over-ear headphones, a dedicated DAC, and an outboard amplifier. But remember, I'm not trying to drive big speakers. I'm driving little tiny speakers. Yes. So we can right-size all this stuff down, put it in your ear, and I'll let your ears be the judge, but you're going to hear very much the same thing you hear with a, a portable uh, wired in-ear device, but you're going to be able to do that wirelessly with our product. Fantastic. So should we have a listen? are the two Lamborghini doors. You know how a Lamborghini yeah. door works, right? Yeah. And it, the earphones go in either side. Oops, this That's is your so cool. Does it feel cool? <laughs> yeah. All right, and then I'll close this door. And let me get the other one out. Oh, yeah, I'll show you. Yeah. You're gonna take this finger uh -huh. and you're gonna feel for the, yeah, you got it. That's fine. And now here, uh, let me put this one in. All right, now I'll close it. So this is correct. Yeah. Now that you've had the feel for it, yeah. pop that door open. There you go. That's your uh, right earphone? Oh, they're tiny. Okay, oh, great. Oh, they are tiny. Great, because all the stuff we were talking about, I thought, all right, we've got some big, big monitors. Well, let me tell you something. Yeah. Um, if I'm not mistaken, tell me if I am, I believe you might be sight challenged. I'm blind. That's right. Yeah. A in your computer has the ability with more software to give you command, control, and interface through what I call a four-dimensional menu. Imagine that you were to look far right yeah. and it reads you a category. You look le right of center, it's a different category. Yeah. Left of center, another category, and far left, a fourth category. 
as you look up and down, it can read you choices from within those categories. Then you can select a choice by clicking your teeth. In that capacity, you yeah. have the ability to command, control, and run from an interface that is completely auditory and hands-free. So for those people in wheelchairs and stuff, that's going to be a game I have, changer. I have a person on my cap table who is a quadriplegic. He cannot use his hands. He can only use his head and his mouth. It's that's allowing Sam Schmidt to yeah. control his computer, to control his home automation, mm -hmm. to bring the elevator down to pick him up. He's actually yeah. a rich guy. He was an IndyCar driver, and he hit yeah. the wall and became a quadriplegic. So I get a little choked up about this, to be quite frank. But of course, we started with something like Hi-Fi because our devices are expensive to make. Yeah. And we needed somebody that could afford to buy the product, and Hi-Fi people and rich people uh, looking for fancy jewelry can do it. Yeah. But the, the real reason that we're doing this is that over time, with more software, I believe ear computing is going to make a major, major difference in the lives for people who are either autonomy challenged, vision challenged, or have other reasons why they aren't in a position to be able to use their hands and their eyes to compute. Yeah, that's very commend that's, can that's commendable. Their voice that's, and other things. Yeah, so, this is, yeah, that's amazing. But uh, hopefully, it feels good in your hands. <laughs> this uh, thing's amazing. Yeah. Pull, uh, pull that one out, mm -hmm. and let me look at it and see its face. Okay, I'm going to teach you how to hold it. Uh, your thumb is going to go on the bottom of the ceramic and this on the top, and that's because the front surface, which you can feel with this it's finger, yeah, it's going to go sensitive. haywire. <laughs> that's yeah. right. Go ahead and okay. put that one in your right ear. Wiggle, wiggle. Get it to where you like it. Let me take a look and make sure that it's centered well. That seems about right. I'm going to twist it once, if, I, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. All right. That might actually Sorry, be too uh, big an ear tip for you, or it might be too small. I think it might be too small. I usually use some, Let me get you yeah. some number fives. Okay. That's so cool. I'm doing a reboot on my phone. We're going to try, I don't usually have customers do this because there's some training involved. Yeah. I'm going to try a head calibration with you. Okay. And uh, show you some head moves. Sure. And I'm going to have you do some voice control too. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is your right ear and that ceramic is top and bottom. Good. You have it perfectly. Is that better size Perfect tip? Perfect seal. Yeah. Perfect okay. Seal. Here's your right hand and there is your earphone. Oh, Perfect. Good seal? Yeah. All right. Okay. All Good right. isolation. Yeah, and we'll, uh, we'll change that for you. Talk to me. Hey, ear micro, transparency on. And uh, now you've got transparency. Yes. And actually, I've got transparency turned up a bit, almost into hearing aid mode. I'm going to yeah. knock that back Please, to Please, yeah, it's really loud. <laughs> let's, let's take it down to a about this range and that should fine. be more comfortable for yes. you. Yes. Now if we say, hey, your micro, transparency off, it's going to turn it back to isolation yeah. mode. Oh. Okay. Now let's try some music and I'll make sure that we turn it down. I don't Thank want you, to, yeah. I don't know where somebody else had it last. Here's the phone. Thank you. You run the volume. It's an Apple iPhone. Yeah, that's fine. You might say, hey, ear micro, next track. Hey, ear micro, pause. So the wake word, oh, hey, ear micro, transparency on. Yeah, Can you immediately. Hear me now? Your wake word is A ear micro. Okay. Then you can say things like pause, play, next track, previous track, volume up, volume down, okay. assistant. You might give it a try. So first try turning your transparency off. Hey ear micro, transparency off. Hey ear micro, transparency off. That's better. Now start your music. Hey, ear micro, play. Hey, ear micro, play. You got it. Hey, ear micro, skip. Skip.
Can Jam 2023 here in London, Westminster, that's a wrap. Would like to thank you guys for coming along with us with this incredible journey. A very special thank you goes out to Spirit Torino, to Headfly, to Jude for inviting us to the panel, to all of our Kellab YouTubers, and for you guys, for all the support. I really do appreciate it. And if you like shows like this and you wanna constantly be informed in regards to our videos, consider joining Patreon or jumping in the private Telegram chat where we can talk about everything we heard back here. I'll see you in the next one, hopefully at SoCal. Peace.